Well, good morning. Um, I think I will introduce the outline for our talk. Uh, I think the uh, essential points, we want to uh, comment on the evolution of uh, transcendental TME or TATME. Uh, then we'll go over some techniques uh, that are currently applied, uh, review some published results, uh, spend some time on challenges of the, of the technique in general, and uh, of course, as you mentioned, the role of TATME in our current practice. And finally, probably end with some tips and tricks. I have no financial disclosures. Um, so the reason we're even discussing TME in the first place, why it became an uh, area of, of great interest, is obviously we all know how difficult TME can be, uh, especially in the American uh, uh, obese population. We know that we can do better. Um, our results, even in the most experienced hands, uh, can still be improved. The incidence of incomplete resection is still uh, as high as 10 to 15 percent. We know this is particularly true in patients with low tumors, uh, really hostile pelvises, narrow mount pelvises in particular. We know our conversion rates still uh, are significant. Uh, in, we have also a significant amount of uh, APR still being performed for lesions uh, that are five and even six or seven centimeters in difficult male pelvises where you're really worried about the distal margin. Uh, morbidity can definitely be improved uh, 30 to 50 percent across the board, and that includes functional disorders and wound complications, long recovery, and all these things that um, um, obviously um, uh, hampers recovery. And so we think we can improve on those outcomes uh, significantly, and that's really what the interest of, of minimally invasive techniques uh, is to try to minimize those uh, complications and morbidity. Um, so TATME really evolved from uh, TEM and then uh, most recently TAMIS, um, Transcendental Minimally Invasive Surgery. We have the adequate platforms to perform this procedure, and this really, in the area of notes, when everybody was so interested in natural orifice surgery, this was really the perfect platform to really take off with this. And the idea was we're already doing um, uh, full thickness resections of tumors, uh, early tumors, and even for more aggressive resections for palliation. We're going through the entire thickness of the rectum. Why not go beyond and apply these platforms and these techniques and these instruments to um, go all the way and actually perform a full rectal sigmoid resection? And sure enough, uh, um, uh, Dr. Whiteford and Swamstrom described for the first time in 2007 at an OSCAR meeting um, essentially the concept of doing just that of using, they used uh, the TEM platform, the conventional rigid platform, and performed uh, uh, essentially TATME for the first time in three human cadavers with, uh, with conventional instrumentation. This obviously sparked a lot of interest, um, uh, especially in, in, in groups working on notes approach, and so it wasn't long until this was converted back to the experimental model animals and, and lots of human cadavers to really define the technique and, and ensure a safety and less than two years later, uh, the first case of hybrid uh, TATME was performed. So with laparoscopic multiport assistance, uh, we were able to perform very elegantly a, a transcendental TME in a patient with a, a T2N1 uh, uh, rectal tumor located six centimeter from the anal verge. And um, this could not have been possible uh, without the, um, Dr. Lacey, who, um, uh, where as his institution was, um, um, had the, uh, the procedure performed at. As you can see here, this is a slide from July 2012. At that time, this was really still fairly considered experimental on IRB protocol, a very handful of cases. And this is a stark difference now. Um, this is as of December 2013. And I'm probably missing a few sites uh, because we're not really, we're having a hard time keeping track of who, you know, who's doing what. But you can get a sense, we think over probably 600 cases up to now uh, have been performed uh, worldwide. It's really catching on very quickly. Um, especially in centers of expertise, already very familiar with uh, laparoscopic TME, robotic, hybrid. Um, so this is just a natural extension of, of all these procedures. So wh what is all the hype about? Why is it so exciting for colorectal surgeons already very savvy with all these techniques? We think that some of the advantages is that when you know where your tumor is, especially when it's slow, say five, six centimeters from the anal verge, um, you have um, the ability to essentially assess the margin, the distal margin from the get-go. So you, f you see your tumor, you can use plastic anoscope, uh, Lone Star, regular anoscope, and essentially identify your tumor, pick out your margins a centimeter below that, put your purse string very elegantly, which will define or at least guarantee um, that you have, you're going to have negative distal margins, and then ob obstruct the rectum so that you can establish um, distension of the rectum below that purse string. Then the scoring, essentially, we have all the equipment at our disposal. You don't need any fancy equipment. We have a cautery. We have TEM equipment, laparoscopic equipment. You can do the very nice scoring of the rectal mucosages like we do in TEM. And then this time, instead of just doing a full thickness excision, you go beyond. So you, once you're full thickness, you can essentially identify the pre space space uh, uh, um, uh, posteriorly and laterally continue that plane. Anteriorly, also very elegantly with the beautiful optics uh, conferred by the 
transdermal endoscopic platforms, you can find a plane between the rectum and the vagina, rectum and prostate very elegantly. Once you got the plane started, you can see here, it's not very long until you realize that the CO2 really helps you with the dissection. It's just incredible. And you can uh, laterally uh, continue the dissection anteriorly. This is definitely the most uh, difficult in a male. Uh, in a female, you have the, the luxury of having finger palpation of the vagina at all times. So you can easily identify, confirm that you're in the right plane and not too anterior, but you can beautifully identify the plane between the rectum and the vagina in this case. Posteriorly is by far the easiest, uh, at least in some of our opinion. You can identify the presicle space and essentially continue dissection very elegantly um, and then continue the dissection as far as you can go, although the, the abdominal team, uh, if you have the luxury of having an abdominal team working simultaneously while they take the vessels and do the splenic flexure, they can eventually meet you down in the pelvis to um, dissect the, um, the remainder attachments of uh, the, the rectum and mesorectum. This is a more difficult case. So this is sort of the difficult case you know, you know, for male patients with low tumors. You know, this is just uh, essentially a tumor one to two centimeter above the dentate line. You can see once we've put the purse string distal to the tumor, you're pretty much on a dentate line. So the safe approach when you're starting with this procedure, we believe, is to actually put the lone star in, uh, be prepared to, to perform at least a partial intersphincter resection using conventional technique. With experience, you can actually do that intersphincteric resection using the TEM or TAMIS platform, but it takes some experience because the planes, I mean, it's, it's a little bit more confusing from the distension of the CO2. But eventually, with experience, you can get comfortable uh, dissecting some of that upper border of the internal sphincter muscle, getting to the right plane, and then essentially complete your TME, essentially completely or near completely using the transdental platform, which is quite um, uh, straightforward uh, once you get the plane identified correctly. It's very, very quick. Uh, to then keep moving up. Again, this is in the same patient. You see that this is a, a narrower space. You can see the levators uh, very tight, much tighter in a, in, a, in, a, in a big male. But you eventually find that that U-shape um, here configuration. You continue your dissection um, uh, posteriorly, laterally, anteriorly. You can see here the beautiful plane between the prostate. Uh, it really allows you very nice exposure um, um, uh, of, the, of the plane. And with minimal traction, you're really able to dissect those planes you know, we believe uh, sometimes much easier than using even the robot um, in those narrow male pelvises. Again, you, en you can enter the abdominal cavity using uh, and, and have a dual assistance from both sides to do this. Now, the reconstruction, we all know those techniques, hand-sewn, coloanal, uh, um, stapled, depending on how much other anal rectal stump you have, um, that's really um, basic judgment from a, a well-trained colorectal surgeon in those techniques. This is what it looks like. Uh, so here, this video shows like your typical, your ideal first case for those who haven't done this procedure yet. Uh, this is a, a tumor that's seven centimeters from the anal verge, so you're well above the anal rectal ring and the sphincter complex. So when you start your score, you can see you're in the rectum. So you know that you're gonna be popping posteriorly at least in a presicle space very easily. You're not gonna be dealing with remainder sphincter muscle. So that's really nice, especially when you're, um, you know, you're kind of getting comfortable with the planes. And you can do a lot of that dissection just with a cautery. We actually recommend using cautery with a hook or spatula or any, you know, device that you prefer. And the reason is because, you know, to identify those planes, you're much better off using the fine tip, delicate, you know, small bite at a time dissection. And then you can switch to a bipolar device if you want. But we really recommend starting with cautery first to really get your planes right. Because if with the bipolar, you take big chunks of tissue, you can get a little lost. So here I've defined... At the bottom, you can see your presicle space. You see how the CO2 is opening up that space very nicely. Uh, you can see the angel hair, as Dr. Uh, Professor Held liked to describe it. And then once you start your, identifying your plane, it's very easy to follow the mesorectum circumferentially. And then you don't want to leave the anterior dissection for, for, um, for last. You really want to do a sort of a circumferential all-around dissection because if, you do, if you're too far ahead in one plane, everything gets distorted. Between the CO2, the platform, the positioning, it can get very confusing. So we don't recommend just, you know, um, uh, doing or going too far with one plane. And you see the abdominal team here. We had the luxury of having an abdominal team who's working on a splenic flexure, and then they already did this, and, and now they're just waiting for the perineal entry. And they're, you know, you can pretty much see it very elegantly. They're doing a little splenic flexure mobilization. In the meantime, if you don't mind tilting the table back and forth, making sure that it's comfortable for both parties, it's actually quite nice to combine and we believe, although we have no data to prove it yet, but we believe this might actually expedite the procedure significantly here. Definitely the, the more dicey uh, plane I was describing to you. So you see the dentate line. We're starting pretty low. We can talk about ticks and tricks at the end in terms of smoke evacuation. I'm sure um, John has lots of tips we've learned the hard way. We have now high flow insufflators that can really help uh, diffuse some of that air. 
Uh, we can talk about our, our preferred uh, uh, technologies without mentioning names, of course, but uh, the idea is that this, we can be very smoky, just like any other TAMIS case uh, or TEM case. So here, just very, very careful uh, mobilization. The risk in here, that probably is the risk that you'll see in the published results, is your risk of urethral injury in a male. And there's no doubt this is the most fear complication because it's just like an APR can happen if you um, are not careful and you can end up um, dissecting above the prostate. It can be very confusing anteriorly if you're very low. You can see here very carefully dissecting those, you know, the, these upper um, uh, sphincter, internal sphincter muscle fibers, really trying to get the plane. The risk is you worry that you're going to get a perf rectal perforation. You worry you're too close to the rectum and you end up moving up and up and up more too anteriorly, and it can be very difficult. And then if you're not careful, you can end up above the prostate. So you really want to be careful, go back to posteriors, which is always easier to find the presacral space. Here, we are finally identified the bottom of the mesorectum, work our way back up. You can sort of see the levator uh, coming into shape here. Stay close and start, you know, and get back anteriorly and continue that, that dissection anteriorly and then not shoot up too high. So you really want to stay close and, and avoid uh, what we think is the biggest risk, uh, the most, uh, the most you know, um, uh, highest risk, which is too anterior of a dissection uh, with, a, with a procedure. So here we're just finishing up. In this case, you can see it's much easier uh, with the finger manipulation of the vagina. You can really identify that plane very elegantly and then can finish your dissection anteriorly. But in a male, you really have to trust that you are uh, not too anterior. And you can see here we're finally go coming around you have the luxury of really seeing the mesorectum beautifully with minimal traction, and the prostate is clearly highlighted. You can start seeing the light now from the abdominal team who's on standby. The abdominal team can be critical. If you get lost in the plane anteriorly and you really have a hard time figuring out where you are, you just wait. You, you do as much as you can not only in posteriorly, and you wait for the abdominal team to come in and help you, and they can lift up on the prostate or the vagina and help finish up that anterior dissection so you're not at risk of injuring the, uh, the prostate. So for the sake of time, I'll, I'll move to the next. So you, I think you get the idea. So what about data? Um, I only included here the largest series. I think it's getting very exciting, and, and uh, now we're really starting to have uh, um, uh, longer outcomes reported, bigger series, multi-center trial. We have one recent uh, multi-center trial from uh, uh, Dr. Tuesh from France. But here I, I did not include the single uh, patient series, just anything from 4 to 56, which there are 12 of them. Robotic uh, TATME, there's been five case reports uh, so far, and it's growing. Uh, but here you can see on, on overall it's primarily for uh, low anterior resection, but also some you can do APRs using this particular approach. We still think it's, it's valuable and helpful. So 247 cases reported to date. Uh, BMI is still pretty low, so we're not going, uh, you know, doing these first cases in patients with a BMI of 40. However, we believe this actually could be um, an, a way to get the TME going in those really big patients. You see the majority of, patient, of, of, of surgeons are using laparoscopic assistance, multi-port, single port, and some robotic as well. Um, platforms all across the board, so it's pretty much doable with anything. You see a pretty acceptable range of OR time and the lesions. We're still pretty careful in selecting them. We really uh, try to avoid T4s. These T4s, uh, except for the group from 1A, 1A really went after the most difficult lesions on purpose, but everybody else is trying to stay away from them. These were sort of incidental T4s, uh, just really for the sake of, of de demonstrating oncologic safety. And you can see the results are quite acceptable. Uh, you have uh, intra-op complications. I mentioned the urethral injuries, two of them in the 1A series. These were within these first five cases. Conversions, obviously what you would expect, uh, a, a couple of them, especially when things get difficult at the bottom and you can find your plane. Uh, but overall, about 8%. Uh, Post-op complication within what you would expect, even better, 30, 30 on average, 30%. Uh, oncologic outcomes, still too early to tell. The 1A series is an outlier because they did select T4s, they did select uh, a threatened circumferential margin, so not, not surprisingly, they have uh, outcomes that reflect this. Lymph nodes, excellent. TME quality, for the most part, you can see 184 complete specimens out of 247, pretty good. It's actually probably the most exciting um, colon here. Is we really think that, uh, at least in the hands of people have been doing this for much longer than I have, think that this is, might help complete your TME um, easier and have really no defects. And so this is the, the one data that I think is, you know, is the most exciting here. Margins, same thing, very few cases of positive margins. Uh, only two case match series so far um, from Lacey's group and another group in, um, in Europe showing essentially no significant advantages uh, so far when you case match those, uh, those patients except with 
a shorter OR time when you have a dual team with TATME, not surprisingly. Uh, possible shorter readmission, although that's, that's hard, you know, it's hard to tell. It's pretty subjective. But here, this group actually thinks that they have a higher chance of completing a mesorectum in TATME, 94 versus 72 percent in a series of 25 uh, versus 25 uh, lap TME. So definitely to, to keep an eye on. Um, I think what makes this really exciting is that you have lots and lots of platforms out there you can use based on what is available to your practice. Operative setup, same thing, lots of possibilities. You can laparoscopic and transinal combination. You can use a robot for your abdominal approach, especially if you're by yourself um, in the community um, and use a transinal. You can uh, combine or do it sequentially. Uh, and then now some people are actually doing the transinal part, uh, like the Atala group, describing their the biggest case series so far, three patients. Still very small, but um, interesting uh, development to follow closely. Operative sequence, as I said, you can combine. Uh, obviously, it gets very crowded in the OR when you have two teams working together, and you have to really be set up well with screens and good communication, but you can otherwise um, uh, scatter them, um, uh, you know, and, and that will affect your OR time big time. So whatever is available to you is doable, just ways to get slicker with this. Uh, challenges, <clears throat> there's no question that we are now under more pressure to standardize this technique, especially as more groups are absorbing it. Uh, it's important to monitor outcomes, obviously, because injuries are, are definitely possible and we need to keep a close eye. Training, credentialing, uh, we really believe fresh cadavers is the way to go. It's the best model for this, but there's no question that we need to focus on training people who already have extensive experience with MIS, TME, and interest in resection and not, and not have people do this procedure who don't have that experience. Um, prospective data uh, or registries and you know endorsement uh, to move to move this uh, forward for our patients. Standardization, uh, no question that we still don't know. Uh, so, I, for example, interesting to resection is it safer to do it open or using the TEM platform? Uh, whichever uh, technique, we not you know it's hard to tell and recommend a strategy because we don't have that much data to, to really uh, evaluate that. A lot of people argue anterior versus posterior. Do you start anteriorly? Is it easier posteriorly? So lots of questions about how you, when you get started, do you need to see the nerves? So occasionally you'll find the nerve iridogenite. Sometimes you'll see the, the hypogastric nerves from the transinal approach. Do you need to see them, or does it mean you're just too lateral? Does it mean you're too posterior? So these are things that we're starting to argue back and forth about. And finally, the operative sequence. I mean, should you start transinally and only take the IMA later? Or oncologically, should you take the IMA first um, and then do the transanal TME uh, later? So lots of questions that, that need answer. I think there's no question about this. The cadaver is a much better model than a pig. Pigs are useless. They don't have a mesorectum. They just have a bunch of nodes. And so we started actively. There have been four cadaver labs sponsored by industry over the past uh, year and a half. Uh, selectively uh, picking on surgeons who do have this expertise because we want to introduce this safely. Uh, so usually small teams, five teams of uh, 10 surgeons, so ideally uh, two teams uh, being trained uh, so that they can replicate this in their institution. We think one to two cadavers if the, the funds are allowed, with the endpoint being the TME quality. So clearly clear assessment and feedback to the surgeon about the quality of their TME and how they can improve and the, the efficiency of their dissection uh, so that they can take that data back. And we'll have some, some data we'll present on some of that experience, at, hopefully at ASCARS um, in 2015. Now, this is the most exciting slide for the U.S., and I'm hoping I'm missing some sites and we'll get some angry emails later. But so far, these are the sites that are actively practicing this, and you can see a lot of them have done cadaver labs. Others have just kind of started on their own. Um, we're kind of keeping, trying to keep track of that and, and hopefully get some feedback on what the best approach is and what the, what, what the next steps are for other groups who want to absorb this procedure. And then finally, very exciting um, uh, initiative from the UK is the, Lo the LORAC uh, TATME registry, uh, which has been sponsored by the Pelican Cancer Foundation, where they, we're going to be collecting that data actively. So far, I, I spoke to um, uh, Roel Homps, who's leading this project. Uh, as of a month ago, there were 27 centers from 11 countries that already were entering patients' data. They had 78 patient entries, and this is growing, hopefully, uh, quickly so we can get a, a snapshot soon of, of what's, what's happening and what the outcomes are in the hands of other groups besides experts, quote-unquote. Um, and, and then as of November 2014, I received the wonderful news from uh, uh, Dr. Monson that um, he, um, he's leading a, a, a registry for the U.S. sites uh, sponsored by the ASCRS Research Foundation. So hopefully in the U.S. we'll have our own registry, uh, very uh, identical to this one, but reflecting U.S. data so we can capture that and follow that closely as well. I'll pass it on to John. John?
Hang on, before you go to John, Pat, let's just uh, take a, a little a second to ask oh, a question sure. or two. But th thank you for uh, giving us a lot of data, history, technique, uh, points of controversy and the like. A um, couple of, of new sites, or not new sites, but a couple of additional sites have joined us. Anne Arundel Medical Center uh, in, in Baltimore, one of uh, my co-hosts, Adrian Park. Geisinger Clinic in Pennsylvania, Minnesota Institute of, of Minimally Invasive Surgery in, in Minnesota, and the State University of Stony Brook in, in Stony Brook, New York. So despite it being January 2nd, up to 14 centers. Uh, curious if, if you could just clarify one or two points. Uh, firstly, has anybody looked at the learning curve of the procedure? Are we to the point that anyone can define what a learning curve is? I know you mentioned the cadaver lab, uh, and that is very helpful. Um, we, we did ours not in U.S., but in Spain with, with uh, Antonio Lacey. He puts on regular courses there, uh, and it is very helpful. But any idea what the learning curve is? Uh, it hasn't been formally evaluated. I think this is a, a very big in area of interest. I think we, the only data that we have is from cadavers. I know at, at Mass General we had, done, um, we had done a total of 32 cadavers, and we found that after five, uh, our OR time and, and accuracy of the dissection, as reflected by the, the integrity of the TME, was, was getting better, significantly better. So we think ideally five. Um, we're hoping with experience, and, and obviously surgeons who have more experience with TME will be lowered to two or three cadavers before they, they, they are able to, to perform um, that procedure safely. So it's, it's a tough one. I think everybody is asking that, that, that very important question. We're, we're not sure yet. Okay. Uh, and do you, do you think at present, and we can ask John the same question, that the procedure is something that requires IRB approval? Uh, you mentioned that people had been doing it with IRB approval, but that it's sort of drifted into the realm of accepted surgery. And I'm just curious what your own opinion on that is. Um, we, when we started, this was still considered to be uh, experimental. I think we were being very careful to make sure there were no major complications. So the first couple were under IRB. I think now the general consensus is well, there's plenty of published data now showing the preliminary safety um, should not be reviewed by uh, uh, IRB just to get started. But obviously, we are encouraging people to collect that data to at least get an IRB for data collection prospectively, uh, but strictly, um, probably not. All right, and, and I think uh, the ASCRS registry will hopefully get up and running soon, so we'll have the uh, availability of, of putting data in and, and then culling data out. And you mentioned robotic for the transanal aspect, and on the one hand, a lot of people say, well, you can do transanal TME to spare the expense of the robot, that you can get a great quality TME, and after all, the uh, a lot of robotic proponents say the sweet spot for it is the distal pelvis in the, in the male. Now here you're saying, well, you can come up from below and do the transanal TME in a male and spare the robot. Now people are saying put a robot back, back in. And, and if I heard correctly, <laughs> maybe even two robots, a trans abdominal robot <laughs> and a transanal. So we have dueling robots. Instead of saving money, we're now going to double the cost. Just, just explain the rationale, please. So... I don't have a rationale for the transgenal robot. I, I, I don't get it, I have to say. I think people are really investigating all approaches and, and trying to be creative. I think it's, it's, um, it's a, a little bit troubling, I agree. I think from the abdominal part, I do have to say there might be an advantage. We think of do double teams working together from the top and the bottom, laparoscopic and, and transgenal TME really mesh, mesh as well. But there's a lot of people who don't have the luxury of, of, of having two surgeons in the OR. You know, so I think the idea would be, well, if you already have a robot and you're comfortable with it, you could do the, the abdominal portion with a robot and then switch to the transgenal TME to do that, that portion or back and forth. And so there's a lot of variations to the same theme. I think we're thinking... For the, for, the, for the surgeon who's alone, who doesn't have resonance, who doesn't have, you know, assistance, you could do the abdominal part, the vessel ligation, everything from the, um, using a robot, and then essentially, you know, flip from one chair to the next to do the transcendental TME. Yeah, or you could probably still save money and hire yourself a partner. But uh, why don't we turn to Dr. <laughs> Marks and, and hear what, uh, how this is being approached in, in Lankanaw. John? Uh, good morning, Steve, and uh, Happy New Year to all of you who are brave enough to get up so early to start the new year. Uh, we're coming to you from right outside of Philadelphia. Here are my speaker disclosures. I'll pretty much speak to whomever wants to speak to me. Sometimes they're happy to hear what you have to say, sometimes not so much. Uh, you know, Pat's done a wonderful job of talking about change and uh, the drivers for change, and there's kind of progressive change and disruptive change. 
I would submit to you that uh, Gerhard Boos in the uh, uh, early 80s, in 1983, des described TEM, and uh, that would certainly qualify as disruptive change. I'm going to go through this stuff very quickly. What I'm showing you here comes from a significant experience in uh, MIS, TEM surgery, as well as rectal cancer surgery. And really the logic of notes for colorectal surgery, as Pat noted, was you're making an entry into the target organ. Uh, the advantage of using TEM for this uh, would be that you're uh, making an uh, uh, injury in the target organ. You have a, a stable uh, platform, and uh, the CO2 is very helpful. So really when we look at everything, uh, there's a real convergence of things that have been going on with SILS laparoscopy. And uh, in our hands, the TATA procedure, which is something that uh, uh, Dr. Gerald Marks first developed in 1984 to address some of these problems. This was in the open era. When you put all this stuff together, uh, this is what you get. And this is just showing uh, in 2008, we're doing an, an advanced uh, a lesion. Now, this is a benign lesion. It ends up being a uh, circumferential excision um, that we're taking out using the TEM. And you can see, as we do this, what the extent of uh, the resection is. And you can see, as we do this, you have really a disc excision. And then this has uh, been followed up by a, a purse string uh, doing this and doing a uh, here we are putting the purse string in using the TEM, and then uh, this allows us from here to do a EEA anastomosis. You know, the evolution of change is such that, uh, you know, June of 2009 was the first time we did this procedure here, and this was in a patient with metastatic disease uh, who had an advanced cancer below, and we got in trouble, not in trouble, but we couldn't progress from above. So uh, in the lower, uh, uh, lower right side here, you see we went in with the TEM once we had done uh, the TATA uh, and used the scissors and attempted to uh, connect the two. It ended up being uh, quite helpful uh, in that regard, and we were able to, uh, as you can see here, we had a team from above and below. We have, with the picture-in-picture picture here, you can see as we're connecting. On the other side here is a patient six months later uh, who came in who'd had uh, indeterminate colitis that had a total proctectomy, uh, I'm sorry, total colectomy, and we did a proctectomy transanally. And here we're showing that we found that in going up from above, it was very restricted with the TEM, and we put in the uh, SILS platform, and I've really advocated that, I've used that pretty extensively since then. Uh, and you can see here we're delivering the specimen out transanally. And uh, if you look here, you can just see up here we're connecting from above and below and delivering that. So all of this together uh, led us to where we are now, which is really the bottoms up uh, TME. And, um, you know, in our experience, and we've done some 30-plus uh, now, almost all but Two of these have been uh, TATAs. Uh, TATA I'm showing here. The incision is starting at the dentate line. Uh, these are for cancers in the lower third of the rectum. Uh, we like to do this transanally, as we've been doing this since uh, 1984. The incision's made circumferentially. Uh, and the key here is to find that uh, glistening of the puborectalis. This is, uh, in my opinion, um, you know, this is very easy to do, and the, the challenge, honestly, of the urethra and the prostate is really negated because you're able to feel this uh, with your hand and your finger, and I find that very helpful. Uh, and really, we take the dissection up to the level of the mid-prostate to seminal vesicles in the male, or generally to the cervix in the female. The, the, really as far as we go, as we go as far as we can go. So we freed this up circumferentially. You can see the uh, rectal wall here uh, anteriorly. This is the puborectalis, and the uh, anus is down here. And then once that's done, the rectum is uh, oversewn and uh, closed and placed up from below. 
We have a series of uh, close to 200 of these now uh, done laparoscopically. And the issue that Pat brought up of taking the IMA first while it's something of interest in Europe is something I think our data really uh, negates entirely. So this is what things look like. We're putting uh, a, uh, a port in here from below, and you can see the anterior mesorectum and the rectum. And this is as much of the dissection as we've done prior to putting everything in. This is what's done uh, transanally. And then once that's in there, you can see the benefit of the uh, dissection. I like to use generally the scissors uh, for the dissection. I show you that as I'm using the ligature. But um, I like to use the scissors, and I generally try to use the scissors without electrocautery because the smoke is quite challenging. Uh, here we are entering uh, very quickly into the perineum. I think the important thing is to cylindrically advance uh, your incision. Uh, so that you're not getting uh, lost in one plane as Pat brought out. So here's the posterior mesorectum. You're in that same areolar plane that you're in. Uh, uh, coming from above, there's the, uh, this is the dissection. It should be relatively bloodless. The, ch the most challenging aspects, in my opinion, are at kind of uh, 9 to 11 and one to three, and you can see the, the nerves here posteriorly, and we're just trying to stay out of that. This is the most challenging aspect here, the nerves here. I always take this with the ligature because there's always some blood vessels there. And this is as you enter into the uh, peritoneal cavity from above. Uh, and here's the mesorectum uh, laterally. The challenge is, is really, you're doing single port surgery transanally. And uh, you know once you do that, We've kind of uh, been interested in going from here, so you always want to make sure you explore the abdomen, and this is done transanally. Um, we've evolved into uh, looking at uh, whether or not we can do the whole operation transanally. Uh, this is kind of, in, in my opinion, the next step. Uh, so this is just going in the abdominal cavity. Uh, you can see where you are, and then here we are, uh, releasing things intra-abdominally. I don't believe you can do this effectively with the uh, TEM or the TEO setup. Uh, we're using a flexible tip uh, Olympus scope uh, in order to, to do this. And again, you know, the, the goal here is to be able to see things very clearly. Uh, it's always traction and counter-traction. You can see we're coming up here along the lateral uh, the line of tolt, extend this up in a cephalad fashion, and this is much as you would do in laparoscopic surgery. Uh, the patient is uh, Trendelenburg and right side down for this part of the operation, and you can see uh, because it's going to be a colanal anastomosis, this has to be a, a very extensive uh, liberation of the splenic flexure. You can uh, see here where we are. This is a uh, Gerota's fascia coming down here uh, that we're uh, mobilizing. You can see the, the pancreas coming off of the mesentery of the uh, transverse colon. Here's the stomach, there's the spleen. If you can get your patients to come in like this where they're uh, pre-identified with labels, it's very helpful. Uh, but we're having a difficult time doing that all the time. So anyway, this is uh, the splenic flexure entirely mobilized. Um, and uh, from here, we're taking the uh, IMA. So you can see this is we're coming up over the sacral promontory. The nerves are over here. We're seeing um, the IMA right here. Uh, we're doing all this dissection with the ligature because uh, any blood in the field quickly becomes uh, quite an issue. Uh, I, I think you're going to find that smoke and blood in a very small confined space uh, becomes uh, an issue quite quickly that needs to be addressed. Uh, this is looking up, here's the IMV and uh, the duodenum, uh, looking at things, and then uh, pulling back to see uh, where we are in terms of the, the IMA. Here's another patient. You can see uh, the nerve fibers coming off the IMA, we've dissected the IMA around circumferentially, 
and uh, we're taking this with the ligature. I would say to you, be quite careful not to do this in someone with atherosclerotic disease, uh, because while we have encountered it, it is uh, challenging to grasp that and then put an endo tie on if your ligature isn't uh, uh, successful. And then, you know, this is just showing the uh, IMA pulsating coming off of the aorta. And then this is really what you're looking at. This is someone, the empty pelvis uh, from above and, and what things look like. And then it's a matter of uh, doing, you know, delivering things uh, transanally. One has to be careful uh, in terms of keeping this properly oriented. You want to make sure you don't twist the mesentery of your neorectum as it comes down, uh, delivering this uh, transanally. This is what the uh, view looks like. We're grasping it with two hands uh, to deliver it uh, so that it's properly oriented. And this is coming out uh, transanally. And we've been doing the transanal delivery of the specimens since around 2005, 2006. And then, as uh, Pat quite rightly said, it's a matter of deciding how you're going to do your anastomosis. In this particular case, we did a uh, side-to-end uh, hand-sewn anastomosis. And these patients are done with a uh, diverting stoma, it should be noted. Um, you know, uh, Joël Lois group uh, in France has described this as well, uh, doing a complete TME notes approach, and uh, you know I think this is the next step. This is perhaps uh, you know the issues that Pat has brought forward are the proper ones. Uh, there is disruptive change, uh, and I think Steve, you're right. This is the hot issue for endoluminal surgery for TOT TME. I think that the challenge and limits uh, are on the table. It has to be demonstrated that we can do this. Uh, equivalently to open and laparoscopic approaches. Contrary to what some have said, uh, I do not think this is easy. I think it's a very challenging approach. One has to uh, learn the anatomy and the view of the anatomy transanally as opposed from above. Uh, there is definite um, challenges to take this to the next step in terms of taking the uh, vessels and releasing things from below. And I think that we're going to need some better equipment in order to do this. Uh, we're making do with what we have, but the challenges of working in the pelvis, uh, smoke evacuation, visualization are quite significant. Uh, I think that uh, this is a journey, not necessarily the ultimate destination. And as uh, Winston Churchill said, it's better to take change by the hand than have it take you by the throat. And that's where we are right now. The patients are very uh, appreciative, I might say, though. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, John, and, and thanks, Pat. Those are two excellent provocative talks. Uh, John, you mentioned using the flexible Olympus uh, camera, and I know that's the way Antonio Lacy uh, prefers it as well. Do you also use 3D, which I know is another one of his um, um, preferences? Right. Uh, I, I have not used it. Uh, we don't have that available to us. Clearly, that's nice. I think that all of this is going to be uh, beneficial over time. But um, I don't have any experience with uh, using the 3D uh, uh, camera, although the optics with that are uh, beautiful. And I think clearly, as you have more of these technologies available, it makes it easier for you to do things. So uh, I'm all for it. The, the other the, the, I, I will say, the though, that the flexible, the flexible tip scope allows the, the camera operator's hand to be away from you. Uh, the TEM gives you stability of your, opti of your optics and keeps you from fumbling with the camera operator, which is a plus. But you have to readjust the control to the table so many times during the operation that for me it's a little infuriating. So I prefer to have a uh, camera operator to deal with as opposed to uh, adjusting and readjusting that the whole time. And you mentioned the smoke uh, getting in the way. Have you tried any of the high flow um, insufflation or dual insufflation systems? Yeah, I think, um, you know, the our number one approach for the smoke evacuation is to try to generate 
very little smoke. So I generally like to use the scissors without any cautery. Um, I have used the, the high flow systems. Um, the biggest challenge is the, the bellowing that occurs uh, with, these, with the insufflator. Uh, I haven't, um, I, I will say just this, that I'm not 100% satisfied with any of the solutions in that regard to date. Uh, let me turn back to Pat, if I might. Any experience with either the flexible camera or high flow insufflation or 3D, any, any of the techniques to facilitate? Uh, yeah, so the high flow insufflation, now the, the big, and I, I'm hesitant to uh, mention names of companies, but there's two companies, two different products. Uh, the European group and uh, Sam Atala, I think, have the, um, has the highest experience. They've used, uh, can I mention the name of the company? <sighs> I, Feel sure. free. If you, well, just, yeah, I uh, mean, just disclose whether or not you work with them. No, I don't. So SurgiQuest is a high flow insufflation has become quite popular, uh, especially in Europe, and it's so high flow insufflation and evacuation of the smoke. Um, it's compatible with uh, the it's essentially all the flexible uh, platforms. I think you can hook it up onto. I'm not. Sh no, you can't use it for the rigid. For the rigid, I've been using the Olympus smoke evacuator, uh, high insufflator, high insufflator, and it's wonderful. So you essentially connect it to one of the openings on the rigid platform, and it's the same concept. Um, and a lot of us actually discovered it when we were using robotics. And um, you have the pedal, so you can activate it when you need it. It collapses your space very little, so it actually maintains the pressure, and it's been fabulous. I have to say, the it improved the smoke evacuation probably by 80%. Now they're Steve, expensive. I would, uh, Steve, I would interject that, that I would interject that while smoke evacuation is an issue, the, the bigger challenge that we've encountered is upon entrance into the perineal cavity, uh, a lot of times then you have the pressure pushing down on your mesorectal dissection from above. And so this has led us to do that, try to do that at the very end, to try and take your dissection as far as you can posteriorly and laterally before you enter into the peritoneal cavity because when you do, uh, regardless of what the smoke factor is, once you do that, sometimes you have an issue from above. Sometimes you have to put a various needle in the abdominal cavity or put a trocar in the abdominal cavity, equalize the pressures in order to proceed. Good, good, good point uh, with which I also agree. Let's turn, I've got a question here from Beth Israel, Mount Sinai in New York. If we could turn there, we've got a question from that group. So one of our new sites. Okay, welcome. Good, good nice morning. Nice crowd good, you have for us. Good morning. Thank you. Yeah, good, good morning. Um, congratulations to Dr. Marks and um, Dr. Silla for their contributions to this field. Uh, really exciting work. Um, I have two quick questions, and then I'd like to ask Dr. Marks' comments. Here's our colorectal surgeon here at Beth Israel. Number one, um, has your, regarding patient selection, your use of imaging changed in any way um, to make this technique more applicable? For example, does um, the use of EUS um, or um, other cross-sectional imaging in any way influence your patient selection? And secondly, um, could you comment more, um, this is for Dr. Silla, on the registry. Um, developing a registry, a multi-center registry, is actually quite complex. Um, who is um, developing that, um, what type of data points are you using, um, is it a cloud-based registry, et cetera. It opens up all sorts of uh, interesting issues, but I applaud the effort because certainly data management is critical to understanding um, where this technology will fall uh, in the future. Joe, do you have any comments? Sure. Just one uh, comment here, um, and I really enjoyed the talk, and thank you for really blazing the trail on this new technology. Um, I guess to best understand this, where would you see this going in the next two to three years in terms of patient selection? Is this still going to be a holy grail of TME, or is this going to be one other method? You know, as we look at the evolving technologies of robotic and the upcoming results of the ro ROLAR trial, and we see the role of laparoscopic and some of the limitations that proposedly are there, how do we, how do we fit this in as a practicing surgeon in terms of which tumors would we want to approach from bottom up, top down? And what, what do you think as, the, as it evolves over the next two, three years, what should we be looking at? Well, uh, I'll, I'll jump in there. First of all, I have to congratulate you with all the people there. Are you guys giving away free turkeys or donuts? Or <laughs> they're a lot, they're quite early. Uh, I, I think that while that is an excellent 
uh, question in terms of where do we see this being applied. Uh, whenever you're developing something and you're trying to develop proficiency uh, and expertise in it, in, in my opinion, in my experience to date, I try to apply it widely so that I can develop that expertise. And then once you become expert in it, then you'll be able to develop and understand better what the limitations are and what the benefits are to do that. Um, that being said, uh, for me, ultimately, I'd like to see in, I don't think it's going to be two to three years. I think it's going to be five to 10 years that we look towards doing more and more transanally to avoid abdominal incisions altogether. Uh, in terms of rectal cancer per se, really this is not dealing with the rectal cancer in any different way from an oncologic standpoint. So the imaging is exactly the same. Um, you're looking at things. Our experience to date has been entirely with neoadjuvantly treated cancers uh, in the low rectum uh, or the mid rectum. I wouldn't do a tata on a cancer in the mid rectum. Then you'd be doing the operation as Pat has described. We just don't see a ton of those. Um, and in terms of where do I see things in the next two to three years, I think you're going to see a lot more people doing this. Uh, I think you're going to need to walk before you can run. I think the benefit, if you get into an issue and you're not sure of things from above, I mean, from below, what we did in the beginning was we always had someone working a laparoscope, at least from above, so that we could see where we were. And then you can... If you have more trouble, you can open up the perineum from above and even meet yourself from above. So I think there's going to be a sequential step forward. I think the ultimate benefit will be in the most difficult patients. I mean, that's what everyone's looking for. But that being said, a, an obese male with a rectal cancer in the low rectum is going to be hard any which way you do it. So I think this is going to be a way to do that, but you're only going to be comfortable with that if you have a lot of experience doing it. Pat? Yeah, so a couple of comments. So in terms of patient selection, I think based on the data so far published and talking to the people doing this on a, on a routine basis, there's no question that we're trying to be careful because we still don't have a lot of long-term oncologic data. So T1, T2, T3, stay away from T3, T4s. Uh, big bulky lesions, stay away from them. Obstructing lesions, stay away from them. The idea is that you don't want or threaten circumferential margin. So your, your pelvic MRI is still critical to stage those tumors because you, the last thing you want is to essentially have an incomplete specimen in a patient with a threat, threatened circum, circumferential margin predicted on the MRI. So that's, these are the basic principles of staging. Um, in terms of, um, uh, you know, the use of this application, I think, you know, uh, John is sort, sort of challenging us. I mean, we started this sort of thinking notes, you know, all transanal um, colorectal resection. I think we're, we're taking a step back now because I think it's, it's still a holy grail, but it's, we're still not quite there because of instrument issues and I think the complexity of the cases. What we realized is that using hybrid approach with abdominal assistance is actually makes a, a regular TME much easier. So technically, you can actually achieve the dissection. The, the hardest part of the TME in the, in the male pelvis can be that distal TME section and achieving a negative margin. And we think we've already facilitated that using the transdermal TME approach. So it can really be combined with pretty much any case. I think people are migrating away from upper rectal tumors because we think with a robotic or laparoscopic approach, you can do a beautiful uh, low anterior resection with TME. But we're talking about the more distal lesions. These are the hardest one. And we think this is, this is the... Um, target uh, or the, the potential um, uh, high points here to be gained is, is for those low, of those low rectal tumors. In terms of the registry, uh, Barry, the um, so the LORIC, the, the UK one is up and running already. It's been up and running for a while. The, the data points were chosen very carefully. It's really uh, trying to collect data on surgeons, primarily patients, demographics, uh, distance from the anal verge, also distance from the anal rectal ring. We're trying to really capture exactly the distance of the tumors, uh, obviously preoperative staging, uh, but we're also going to collect things like, um, you know, use of stomas, spinal flexion takedown, uh, whether or not the, um, um, uh, you know, what, what equipment was being used, uh, co intraoperative complications, so the whole spectrum of things, outcomes, oncologic outcomes and functional outcomes, so questionnaires-based quality of life uh, to see how those patients are doing in short and long term. 
In the U.S., this is not up and running. Um, it's it's going to be modeled after this. The issues are obviously cloud-based. So it's, right now, it's currently managed by um, uh, by a company. The big question is whether or not uh, this is going to be acceptable in terms of HIPAA and um, uh, data um, uh, monitoring and, and patient confidentiality. So these, these, all this has to be sorted out. But it will be just uh, um, it shouldn't take very long to get that up and running. Yeah, I'll, no, I'll I would chime um, in there. Uh, uh, John, hang on a sec. Just as uh, in the interest of time, uh, we're going to need to go to one other site. But as ASCRS Research Foundation president, I can tell you, you mentioned John Monson. He's working very diligently to resolve all those issues, and we are hoping to get it appropriately funded and launched soon. But, John, I, I need to cut you off and go to Mount Sinai, Mount Sinai, Mount Sinai, as opposed to Mount Sinai, Beth Israel, uh, who also have a question for us. Uh, good morning. Can you hear me? Barry, good morning. <laughs> yes, good morning, it's, Barry. It's Barry Golf course is closed today. I really, right? <laughs> it's cold. So, and Happy New Year to everybody. Uh, I, I just find it kind of interesting, maybe a little bit on the histor uh, historical side, being involved in a disruptive technology uh, at a very early stage. Uh, my hat's uh, off for both uh, Pat and John in terms of what's uh, what you're presenting. Uh, but if you throw Dr. Wexner into the milieu a little bit, I remember clearly um, when we were trying to decide, ASCRS was trying to decide how many patients you really needed to be comfortable with in, ter in terms of doing this type of complex surgery. And I think John shows very clearly that the techniques of doing this is really critical in terms of getting a good result. And as he said very clearly, it's not easy, and you're looking at it from a different plane. So I guess my question and a comment is, is, is how much do you really want to throw this open for everybody at a very early stage with two or three fresh cadavers and then say it's okay to go ahead and do this? I really I understand the collection of data, and I know what we need, need all that, but it just makes me a little nervous when you're talking about rectal cancer here um, in terms of just letting it out there for, for everybody after a little bit of training. Kind of reminds me of the early days of laparoscopic cholecystectomy with a little bit of training. What happened? Uh, it was a disaster. So I'd just like some comments about that and maybe even uh, maybe more comment from Steve who is going to be like maybe the uh, intermediary here. Well, it depends what the two of them say, but those are very good points, Barry, uh, very well taken. Of course, we can't prevent people doing what people are going to do, but still we'd That's like right. to hear the sage advice that might be imparted. And I, I guess, John, you were going to jump in, so we'll give Pat last word here. Go ahead, John. Why don't you take this one first? Sure. Well, we presented the American College of Surgeons in the fall our experience with the case match TME uh, case matching the, the TAW TME to the laparoscopic TAW TAW from above, looking at completeness of TME resection, uh, both of which were in the mid 90 percent, and uh, both of which were fine on 20 in the 20 some uh, cases. So, I think that you can do it. I think that in terms of how many, and the, the question, Barry, how many of these do you have to do before you become comfortable? Uh, I'll tell you when I become fully comfortable. It, for me, it's not yet. Uh, and I, I think it is going to take some significant time for people to do this. I, I don't think this is the end all and be all. And I, I think it's going to be very difficult to jump in after two or three cadavers uh, on the one hand. On the other hand, you know, these are cases that are being done laparoscopically. I think you can safely and ethically do a com combination of the two and take yourself from below until you feel comfortable and then go from above. And I think it's incumbent upon uh, the surgeons who are getting started to feel comfortable and safe and recognize that the goal is to do the operation perfectly, uh, not to do it in a TA TME, not to do it laparoscopically, but to do it in the best oncologic fashion for your patient. And I think that, of course, has to be at the forefront of all our minds as we embark down this road. Okay, Pat. Um, I would agree. I think the, the the again 
the goal is not to go ahead from the bottom and do the entire resection and get into the belly and do the splenic flexure takedown and visualize the pancreas. I mean, you, 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 this is not what the goal is. The goal is to make your TME easier and to facilitate it, and not just to prove a point. So I think, you know, it's less of an issue um, if you're targeting or at least training first, the first wave of people we all agree should be people who are doing these techniques or doing laparoscopic TME very comfortably or doing interesting chart resection. We already have the skill set to do this, not people who don't use TAMIS or TEM. So I think that's going to be the first wave is to make sure that those people who are adequately trained to do this can do this and do it well and get comfortable. And then, and then we can, obviously, at the same time, we'll be pushing the envelope to do more, you know, full dissection from the bottom. And I think the key is if we, if we make sure that the people training in this are people who are really already doing a lot of TME and very comfortable, I think, I think we'll, we'll be okay. And uh, so we shouldn't be training, mass training people who are not doing low anterior resection for tumors of five centimeters or four centimeters from the anal verge. If those people are not comfortable doing it laparoscopically, I think we're going to have a problem if they're starting to try to do it from the bottom because they won't understand the anatomy. If they're not doing interesting to resection, they will get into the wrong plane and they, they will be urethral injuries and all that kind of thing. Well, I think I'll, I'll use this um, last question that, that Barry nicely raised. Uh, to say that we need to put it in context of rectal cancer surgery overall. And in the United States, we know from a variety of data, including a paper that John Monson presented on behalf of the Ostrich Group, Dave Dietz, Feza Ramsey, myself, Mariana Barrow, George Chang, Jim Fleshman, a few others, presented at American Surgical that was just published in Annals perhaps two months ago, that in the United States there's tremendous variability in, in rectal cancer surgery. There are entire counties in the United States where only APRs are performed. No restorative resections are performed. There are surgeons who perform the majority of their cases as APR or exclusively APR in very large numbers despite the tumors being higher up. You look at studies like Bake from California or Harmon from Maryland and you find that hospitals are defined as high volume if they've done, if they're doing one rectal cancer per month at the hospital, the entire hospital, let alone per surgeon. So a lot of these issues are going to self-select because you talk about surgeons being adept in laparoscopy. There are a lot of surgeons who aren't even adept in open TME, not the surgeons on this call, not the surgeons participating in, in innovations conference, active in SAGES and ASCRS, but there are a lot of surgeons out there who do an occasional rectal cancer, and I don't think, I would hope that they're not going to employ this technique if they're only doing one rectal cancer every three months or something like that. It has to be done in higher volume to understand the anatomy from whatever perspective. And I think it does, it, it does fill a role. It's, you said it. It's not for the upper rectal cancers, and it's not going to totally replace any of the other techniques, but it's going to be another approach for certain tumors. It, the sweet spot may be the obese male with the distal anterior tumor, for example. Who knows? But we'll find certain areas where this works. The point is you have to have a dedicated, focused interest and a high volume of rectal cancers to make any of these techniques successful. Otherwise, you really need to be honest with yourself and you're with your patients and say, you know something, this isn't what I deal with on a daily basis. And rather than an APR, or rather than an intersphincteric that is really going to be a sphincteric excision and render you incontinent, because I don't know what I'm doing, you know, I'm not going to do it. I mean, that's a tough point, but it's really, I think, where we're going to involve. My last point is the Commission on Cancer and the uh, regents and, of the American College of Surgeons and leadership have accepted the ostrich proposal and accreditation for rectal cancer centers as an additional level of accreditation above COC accreditation is in process. The program will be rolled out over the next two years. And it's not saying you can't do these things, but you have to monitor them very closely. You have to be cognizant of your results. And these patients have to be treated in a multidisciplinary team effort in centers with a dedicated interest. I think whatever is done. Anyway, in the interest of time, uh, we're an hour into the conference. I want everybody to please thank Dr. Sill and Dr. Marks for superb presentations. So uh, welcome Barry and the crew at, uh, well, both Barry's at both Mount Sinai campuses, but particularly our newest Barry from uh, Beth Israel, Mount Sinai. Thank everyone for participating. Big round of applause for our presenters, and we'll see you on February 6th when Dr. Shower moderates. Thank you. Thank you.